All right, let's face it. If you're watching this video, you are probably rich. And the question is, like, how do we define rich? Is it the top 1%, top 5%, top 10%? So what I want you to do is go over to this website, globalrichlist.com, and I want you to type in your annual salary. And I want you to see how you compare to the rest of the world. And that's what this website does, and it's, it's eye-opening. And so I'm going to sit here and wait. I'm going to wait for you. So go ahead and pop open another tab so you can go check it out, and I'll just be right here waiting. So what do you think? Were you surprised by the results? Was it what you expected? Do you suddenly feel a little bit richer than maybe you did before? So if you're anything like me, you were probably shocked by what you saw. You know, it was really eye-opening, it was humbling. For me, it like took my gratefulness and appreciation to a whole nother level. So the thing is for most of us, and especially those of us in the US, we are just surrounded by so much wealth and so much extravagance that we don't feel rich. Because relatively speaking, compared to the guy next door, the guy who has a bigger house, we're not rich. But if we can actually take an accurate view, and that's what I love about this website, is that it allows us to accurately see how wealthy we actually are. And the truth is, those of us who are Christians in America, we are among the wealthiest believers who have ever walked the earth. And in 1 Timothy 6, Paul actually has some really important things to say to the wealthy that I think absolutely apply to us as American Christians today. And he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So in the rest of this video, we're going to unpack these 10 things that God has for us as rich Christians or American Christians to do with our money. All right, if we haven't met, my name is Bob Loddick, and on this channel, we give you practical tips and strategies to put more money in your pocket, and then we also talk about timeless biblical principles on how to manage our money wisely. So if that's something that resonates with you, you can definitely hit that subscribe button and the bell down below if you want to hear from us as we create more content like this. Now, as we're going through here, definitely scroll down to the comment section down below and feel free to add anything, any additional thoughts you have, any questions. Really, let's just turn this into a bit more of a conversation rather than a monologue with me just sitting here talking to a camera. All right, with that out of the way, let's dive into these 10 instructions for rich Christians on how we should be handling our money. First up is an admonition for us not to be haughty. And haughtiness is defined by Miriam Webster as blatantly and disdainfully proud. And it essentially points to the stereotypical rich snob that we all kind of have encountered who actually believes that they are better than someone because they have more money. And I think there is a natural tendency for us as our net worth grows to to let that kind of creep in, which is why I think Paul mentioned it, why it was the first thing that he mentioned, because I think it's something that we can all fall victim to without even knowing it. All right, number two is that he says not to put our hope in money. And this is one that I have struggled with so much, where I find myself with my bank account not having as much as I want, and I suddenly feel uncertain, and I feel shaky. You know, and then on the other hand, when my bank accounts are full, and it feels like I have a good savings built up, it's like I feel a bit more secure. That is just me putting my trust in money, and I should not be doing that. There's nothing wrong with having some money in your bank account, but the problem is, is if, if I'm putting my trust in that number, you know, or that amount of cash in that savings account, that is not a good thing. You know, which leads us to number three, where he says to put our trust in God, because God is the provider. God is the one who in Philippians 4.19 says that he will supply all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's not our job. It's not our savings account. It's not our 401k. It's not the government. God is our provider. And number four on the list, I love because he says to enjoy your money. And this is one that I've noticed over the years from talking to a lot of different readers that a lot of people really struggle with this. And so even if they have a lot of money or a little money, it doesn't really matter because a lot of people just really struggle to actually enjoy their money. And sure, some people have no problem spending money, but a lot of times they actually feel guilty about spending it. And that's why I just love that this is in this verse because it's an admonition to us to enjoy what we've been blessed with. And obviously this can be taken to the wrong extreme 
extreme, but I think for a lot of us, this is something that we need to hear. You know, and in point number five, he says to do good with our money. And I'm reminded of the parable of the talents where the stewards are entrusted with something and they're expected to do something good with it. And we are called to do good with our money. So I think one of the most obvious things is just not spending it all on ourselves is one of the obvious ways to do some good with our money. And number six ties right in where he says to be wealthy with good works. So instead of focusing all of our mental energy on how we can build our own wealth, we should be spending some of our time figuring on how we can use this abundance that we've been given to help and make the world a better place. Number seven, he says to be generous. And generosity really should be the true mark of every single Christian. We've been given so much and God has proved himself as such a generous, kind, and loving father that this should be a natural expression of our love and our desire to honor him with the abundance that we've been given. And number eight, he says to be ready to share. You know, and I like that he says to be ready to share because there are practical things that we can do to get ready to share. And so I think attacking things like greed and pride and selfishness and honestly even debt. So for me, I see this as additional motivation to pay off debt so that I'm not paying all this interest to banks, but that I have more that I can share. Number nine, it instructs us to store up treasure in heaven. And this phrase is mentioned a handful of times throughout scripture. And essentially we do this by giving and by our generosity. And number 10 says to hold firmly to true life. And Jesus is our source of true life. He came to give us life and that much more abundantly. So keeping our gaze firmly fixed on Jesus and always staying focused on him is one of the best things that we can be doing. So that sums up this passage from 1 Timothy 6 and I'd love to hear if you'd add anything else. If there's anything else you think you should add or any comments or thoughts, drop them down in the comments down below. If you found this helpful, I'd love it if you could leave us a thumbs up, but that is all we have for today. So have a great rest of your day and I'll see you in the next video.